Your Majesty at your service. Welcome to Fair Queen Talks. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of my podcast. Then comes marriage. In honor of the month of love, I will continue to put out content on this podcast this month, All Things Love. I hope that last weekend during Valentine's, you were appreciative of the love that you have in your life, including loving yourself. So as I said, this month, I'm going through the nursery rhyme about love. You know, the one about kissing in a tree. And if you do want to hear me sing it again, (laughs) please just check out season two, episode 16, Lovers of Love. So last week, I explored the sentence, first comes love. And on this episode, I'll be exploring the sentence, then comes marriage. I'll be mainly focusing on what love looks like in marriage from my own perspective and experience. I have previously shared that I believe that romantic love should lead to marriage. Through marriage, I think it's important for couples to create, whether this means creating a shared purpose, building a family unit or a legacy, amongst other things. I think that through marriage, you can create greatness individually and as a unit. Now, I know that it's not everyone's goal or desire or reality to be married. But what I do know is that if people in marriages treated their commitment with the utmost respect and love, a lot of the issues and stigmas around marriage wouldn't exist. At this point, I must share with you that for me, marriage is not just a piece of paper. I do recognize that it's a legal contract bound in law. However, for me, marriage is about entering into a covenant with your spouse and God. My view on marriage is heavily influenced by my faith and examples of love in my life. Also, to those people who focus more on weddings opposed to marriage, I have a message for you. It may be worth remembering that when celebrating your marriage in the form of a wedding, you're happy to also be alone with the person you're marrying without all the glitz and glam. I will now share a personal story to kind of illustrate to you why I think this way. So before I knew my husband, I had a dream about going to a hotel room after my wedding. As I entered the room with my beautiful dress, hair and makeup, I saw a man lying in the bed, fully clothed by the way, in a very nice suit, but I couldn't really see or recognize who he was. So when I woke up, I made a vow to myself that I would make sure that I knew and trusted the person I would spend my wedding night with. So for the people who are focusing more on weddings opposed to marriage, I would say focus on who you are marrying over the color scheme that you'll have on your wedding day. Anyway, as you may have guessed by now, if you're new to this podcast or, you know, you just want to check out what I'm talking about today, I'll have to let you know that I've been married for five years now. I've watched so many films and TV shows about love, marriage and family And I will tell you that every love story, every marriage, every family is so unique and there's so much that we we can learn from all of these love stories. And I think that's why I'm willing enough to share some of mine. So having watched many of my friends say their wedding, uh, wedding vows to their loved ones, it really made me emotional because it's so beautiful to see, you know, a friend getting married. But when I walked down the aisle with my dad, and uttered my vows to my husband-to-be, I have never experienced the feeling of being overwhelmed by love at that point of my life. It truly confirmed to me that I made the right choice. But we all know that the wedding day is only the start of marriage. It's not just new happily ever after. (laughs) That's when the, the actual time starts. But at the point that you, you know, you said your vows, you're so excited about this new life you're going to have and working towards creating things and you go on your honeymoon and you're just blinded by love and for a moment you're in a very big bubble, the love bubble in my experience. It takes a while before reality hits you, like six months or a year sometimes. 
and you start realizing that marriage is like a never ending roller coaster. At times it can be exciting, comfortable, cozy, but also scary, challenging. You will go through all forms of emotions throughout marriage and being five years in now, I feel that I can somewhat speak on it. So I will go through the traditional vows and share my thoughts on them. Sorry, I can't pronounce my teeth today. (laughs) My intention is to explore how love operates based on the vows that you make. So the vows that I'm going through today are the following. I take thee to be my wedded wife or husband to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. Now I'm not crying when I'm saying this now, but when you say this for real, it's it's a whole other level of saying things. So let's explore these sentences. So the first one, I take thee to be my wedded wife or husband. When stating this sentence, you're publicly declaring to your loved ones and friends that you're lawfully to be married. So when I see couples who call each other husband or wifey and treat each other in such manner, I think it's all good. However, to make this commitment lawful, it is a statement and declaration of lawfully being recognized as a unit. It comes with so many privileges and protection to be married within the law and also solidifies your relationship legally. So it's not just about making a contract. A step further from this for people of faith like myself, being lawfully married is declaring your love and commitment to each other before God, which for me takes it to a higher level. The level of accountability for marriage is no longer just in law. In Christian scripture, it states in Matthew 18, 18 in the King's James Bible, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. With that being said, entering into the covenant of marriage is not only for our earthly existence, but in heaven also. To have and to hold from this day forward, To have and to hold, it's not about ownership, rather it's the right to be in a position to claim that the person is yours to share life with and to hold on to throughout all the stages of your life. And this is why inmates, for example, are able to be with their spouses even when incarcerated. For better, as you're creating all kinds of things in your marriage and success comes, you are promising to be with this person. Your spouse is able to witness you when things are all good and happy. You promise to share the good times with each other. For worse, life is not always sweet and we will have some bad days. And in moments where I have felt sad, for example, in my life throughout my marriage, I've been able to count on my husband to make me smile and he knows exactly what to do to cheer me up when when I'm at my worst. For richer. Now, I can't say I've experienced for richer, but I'd like to think that if I or my husband was making a six-figure salary, that we would be humble enough to want to stay together. I say this because I have seen some people in the media that when making a lot of money, they all of a sudden want to upgrade their spouses. I would like to think we would still be as committed to each other when we, you know, have economic wealth. However, on that point, we can be richer in different ways, like in knowledge, for example. And I would say that although I studied for a master's and my husband didn't, I don't feel or walk around my house being like, oh, because I got a master's, I'm more intelligent. I still respect him and his intelligence, regardless of, you know, the qualifications he has or what I have. So whatever you become richer in in your life, you should still love and respect your spouse. For poorer, well, let me tell you, many moons ago when I wasn't making a consistent income and I was becoming broke in my own terms or in my own accounts, my husband reminded me that my worth and value 
does not come from my financial independence and that I bring value to our home and marriage regardless. Again, poor is not just about finance. It's also about poor attitudes and just just having this negative way of looking at life. And I'm glad to have a husband who is transparent enough and open enough to point out the things in me to make me a better person in sickness. Man flu is real and I'm willing to look after my man when he is sick. And when it's my turn to be sick, he looks after me. I remember once I hurt my back and I couldn't move for a week. He treated me so well and looked after our home in the same way that I would look after our home. It really showed me and proved to me that we love each other, whether we're able to move around or not. And I think it's good to have someone that you can count on when you're not feeling well. In health. So when we are of good health, we can do so much. We are happier and it's important that the same energy our spouses show to us when we're sick is the same energy that we, that, that we bring when we're all good. Like, for example, bringing breakfast in bed. It, it shouldn't just happen when you're ill. It's nice to treat each other and do nice things for each other when you don't have to or are not required to. To love and to cherish. Like I said last week, to love is to show that you value another person. It's about showing respect, kindness and appreciating another person. When you cherish someone, this becomes second nature. In marriage, you must keep this level of behaviour throughout all the stages of your marriage. You wouldn't mistreat your favourite person in the world, would you? Mm. Sometimes we hurt the people closest to us. And that's why we need to consistently and consciously love and cherish our spouses. We need to actively participate in our marriage. And lastly, till death do us part. Now, this part for me is tricky. Although in law, the marriage ends upon death. In my faith, we marry for time and eternity. For me, my commitment in marriage is for this time on earth and the afterlife. So I have an expectation to still be married after we leave this existence and are all happy in heaven. And whether you believe that or not, I think it's comforting to think or believe that your love and commitment is forever and has no expiry date. So if you're married, looking to be married, soon to be married, it's important to show love throughout all the stages of marriage and your relationship. I must say, however, that marriage is conditional. You should honour your vows and show respect to the covenant and legal contract you have entered. If at any point any of the spouses have disobeyed the vows and disrespected the marriage, either spouse is not obliged to stay. I hope that as you're tapping into your greatness, that you involve yourself in relationships and commitments that allow you to flourish and that you can create a positive legacy. Love in marriage for me is a commitment that is bound by the law and in heaven. So we must treat it with utmost respect. At the end of each episode, I address the queendom. Marriage is more than a piece of paper. Focus on a marriage opposed to the wedding. The commitment of marriage is bound by law and in heaven actively participate in your marriage. Thank you so much for listening to Fairfin Talks. See you next time.